You realize we're six days away from Miami Hurricanes football. Let's project that depth chart. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, your host of a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet and contributor to allhurricanes.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today, even on a Sunday. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So Saturday, September 3rd, uh, this is Sunday, so we're six days away from it. Your Miami Hurricanes will run through that smoke at Hard Rock Stadium, take the field for the first time in the Mario Cristobal era, to take on the Bethune-Cookman Wildcats. I hope you guys enjoyed week zero yesterday. Uh, I was surprised, shocked by Northwestern beating Nebraska over in Dublin. I had been tempted to bet Nebraska minus 11 in that game. Thankfully, I didn't. I passed on that one. You know, Florida State beat Duquesne, whatever. Uh, You know, North Carolina, they, they they had to labor a little bit to beat FAMU, their secondary got cooked some. FAMU played with a lot of heart. North Carolina, of course, did come out on top there. So now we focus our attention to our Miami Hurricanes. And nothing official yet from the team, but we want to project the Miami Hurricanes depth chart too deep heading into that Bethune-Cookman game. I'm going to be looking at a piece here. My colleague Luke Cheney at allhurricanes.com has released his first projected depth chart Um, I agree with most of it. I disagree with some of it. I give Luke a lot of respect, and he joins the show pretty much every Friday. I give Luke a lot of respect because he's been out uh, probably at more practices than any other media member. He's been out to more practices than probably some of Miami's coaches have and players. So uh, he's certainly been soaking this stuff up. So let's go through this too deep. I'll give you – I'll interject three and four deep for some of these positions, of course – Uh, We'll start at quarterback, which is the most obvious. Tyler Van Dyke is your starting QB. Jake Garcia is your backup. We know how good TVD is and is supposed to be this year. Heisman shortlist, Maxwell Award watch list, Davey O'Brien watch list. He's on basically every watch list in the entire country. I think he's going to live up to that hype as long as his wide receivers can hold on to some footballs, as we've discussed. But TVD is the real deal. And I think Jake Garcia is the real deal. If for whatever reasons throughout the year, Jake has to play or play a considerable amount, Miami's going to be fine. Uh, Jake Garcia, I believe, is good enough to be the starter on most Power 5 programs out there. He's had an excellent fall camp. TVD, though, has had the best fall camp in the quarterback room. He is the unquestioned starter. Jake Garcia is the number two. You know, you can kind of ceremoniously consider – Jakari Brown, the true freshman, to be the number three. The official depth chart might end up saying like Peyton Matoka or Jakari Brown because, you know, Matoka's been around for a long time. He's been in the program, but obviously Jakari Brown is the guy with more upside and the more chance of of being a starter at some point in the future. Okay, Uh, let's go to running back. Now, this is a position. There's been good competition at running back during fall camp. Before fall camp started, I would have told you Henry Parrish would end up being the starting running back. It's very close between Parrish and Jalen Knighton. In fact, once the official depth chart comes out, it may have an or in between their names. Like it may say Jalen Knighton or Henry Parrish, but uh, I think Rooster has just been a little bit better. They're very similar backs, similar running styles. They're both threats to catch passes out of the backfield. Uh, I think Knighton's explosiveness and top end speed gives him a slight edge there. So uh, I I think it's going to be Knighton, number one, Parrish, a very close number two. And I think they're both going to get a lot of carries. And then, you know, early on in the year, I think Don Chaney's going to come back at some point. Uh, I, you know, he had even posted on his Instagram, he's going to be out a month. So he could be back for conference play, Chaney. Um, Trevante Citizen is going to miss significant time, unfortunately. But yeah, I think it's going to be, of course, Rooster one, Parrish two. Thad Franklin, who I'm not sleeping on at number three. Maybe Devin Perry will be next on the depth chart, uh, but eventually Don Chaney is going to be fighting for a third or even second spot on the depth chart once he's able to come back healthy. Then you get to wide receiver, things start to get interesting. Um, So 
And Luke has been uh, has been really covering this position closely as we have here on Locked on Canes. As the outside Z receiver, he's got Jacoby George as the number one and Michael Redding as the number two. Now, Jacoby George, I think, has had a pretty nice camp. He looks to be the smoothest, most fluid route runner. And he was a great deep target last year. Only had seven catches last year as a true freshman. So the sample size was small, but he averaged 26.2 yards per catch last season. So if George can pull it all together, he can be a weapon. And then Michael Redding, um, I'm hoping and expecting him to get a lot more burn this year. In his previous three years at Miami, I think he's got four total catches. So I think this could be the year because he's had a good fall camp. I think this could be a season where Redding, who I like a lot, can put it all together on the field. Uh, so that's outside Z receiver. For outside X receiver, he's got Keyshawn Smith, who started all 12 games last year as the number one with Frank Ladson as the number two. That's an interesting one. I think that battle's going to continue into the season, right? I mean, Keyshawn obviously has the advantage of having been in the program, relationship already with Van Dyke and with his teammates. Ladson has the experience advantage and the advantage of coming from a winning program and a winning mentality in Clemson. So I think those two are going to be competing throughout the season. And then at slot receiver, Xavier Restrepo at number one, Rashard Smith at number two. They've both had really good camps. So, um, you know, if, if it ends up shaking out, and, you know, Xavier Restrepo is going to be a starter. I don't think there's any question. He's been Miami's most consistent receiver in camp. But Brashard Smith has been really good. He's popped a lot, Mario Cristobal has said. So they're going to find ways to get Brashard on the field as much as possible. They can line him out wide. They can line him up in the backfield. He's a Swiss Army knife. He's just a weapon. So let's get to tight end. Um, I agree with Luke's prediction. And my, I think Miami is – Five deep with serviceable tight ends. There's, you know, top heavy though. Will Mallory is the number one. Elijah Arroyo as the number two. You know, Mallory's got the most experience. Um, Elijah Arroyo though, I think this is going to be a breakout year for him. So, and and also Miami's going to have multiple tight ends on the field a lot. So I can agree with that. Will Mallory number one. Arroyo number two. Um, then we'll have to see kind of who gets who's the next guy in after them. Jaleel Skinner has the most upside, true freshman. Um, you know, he's a little bit inconsistent with catching footballs in camp. He's so young, though, and he's so dangerous. You can use him as a jumbo wide receiver as well. Khalil Brantley is a really good receiver, and Dominic Mamarelli is a really good run blocker. So Miami's got five tight ends who can play, okay? Let's get into the offensive line. Left tackle, Zion Nelson, number one, John Campbell, number two. Now, Zion is not fully healthy right now. I don't think he's going to play in the Bethune-Cookman game. He might be ready to go, but I'm expecting Campbell, who's had a really good fall camp, and I'm rooting for John Campbell because he's coming off an injury of his own from last year. He's been excellent in practice, uh, so he'll probably be the guy to open the season starting at left tackle, and then once, once Zion's healthy, it's probably his job, of course. Then left guard, number one guy, Jalen Rivers. Number two, Jonathan Dennis, transfer from Oregon. Center, Ja'Kai Clark, number one. Yes. Logan Sagapalu could be the second stringer there. Now, Sagapalu could be the second stringer at multiple positions and the first stringer at a certain position. So this goes to show you the versatility, the cross-training this offensive line has done. And Luke Cheney noted this, and I agree with it. Um you know, the Miami's offensive line, it's, you know, it, do it doesn't quite have crystal ball depth. Like Mario likes to have. 10 at least guys like two full units that can just rotate uh they are not quite at that they're more at like seven or eight who can rotate and play well but Miami's offensive line could be good like they look pretty good on paper especially the left side from center to left guard to left tackle they look really good a few more question marks and battles on the right side so at right guard Luke has Logan Sagapalu with the slight edge over Justice Oluwazi. And there's been competition there, no question. Uh, Sagapalu, who's, who's a mauler, probably has a slight advantage having come from Oregon, you know, already having the understanding and relationship with Mirabal and Cristobal. But Justice is competing. And then at right tackle, probably DJ Scaife with John Campbell behind him. But Campbell is versatile enough. I think he's going to end up playing a lot this year. So John Campbell, like, don't think because, hey, he may not be listed as a starter 
full-time starter at any position that we're not going to see him a lot. I think we will see him a lot this year. So let's take a look at the defensive line. Now, we're going to get to this, and he did address this in his piece. Luke left somebody off, okay? And I, 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 I don't know if I agree here. So let's start with the defensive end spots. On one side, he's got Akeem Mesador, transfer from West Virginia as the number one. I can agree with that, with Mitchell Agude backing him up. Then at the other defensive end, and just for the sakes of this depth chart, I know that the formation may not always be this way. We're approaching this as a 4-3, right? So just, you know, for well, let's not squabble about formations. We're just, let's just go for a, a 4-3 for the sake of getting through the depth chart. And then on the other side at defensive end, he's got Jafari Harvey and Chance Williams. Then at defensive tackle, one defensive tackle spot, Daryl Jackson Jr., my guy, first team Aldano, transfer from Maryland with Jordan Miller, the human squat machine. That dude is strong behind him. And then Jared Harrison Hunt with Jake Lichtenstein, USC transfer on the other side. Where is Leonard Taylor? Woo, that's a that's a funny. He says talented sophomore defensive lineman Leonard Taylor is a notable exclusion from this depth chart. His versatility will be utilized as he will play some at tackle and some at edge. I wonder about that. Uh, it's like it's just it's hard for me to imagine Leonard Taylor not being a starter. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, here's here's a, another area where I I disagree just based on the evidence coming out throughout camp. Uh, it, it's at linebacker, middle linebacker. Uh, Luke has Caleb Johnson, who you guys know I love, and Chase Smith at number two. Um, I'm not sleeping on Corey Flagg. I know that Corey Flagg does get slept on a lot because, you know, he's only 5'11", and he's considered to be a guy with some limitations. Um, but I'll give you, you know, Charlie Strong said this week, this past week, that Flagg is the linebacker who's having the best fall camp and I spoke with Joe Zagaki the Miami Hurricanes play-by-play -play voice earlier this week and he said quote right now Corey Flagg is your starter at middle linebacker he said you cannot move him out of that spot Charlie Strong has been with him every single day Strong coaches him hard and I watch Corey Flagg respond to it so you know I wonder um I certainly I certainly think that just you know comparing player to player Caleb Johnson looks better to me but it sounds like Corey Flagg has actually, you know, been the one holding it down. Um, so let's go with uh, weak side and strong side. Weak side linebacker, Luke projects Wayman Steed to be the starter. I agree with that. With Keontre Smith is the number two. And then strong side linebacker, not forget about this guy, the stars, the star position, Gilbert Frierson. Whew. He had a really good spring game. He's having a nice camp, had a nice camp. And Wesley Besaint probably is the number two. I think there's a, there are going to be a lot of guys, I think, who get reps at the star position. Uh, then you get to the secondary. Uh, outside corners, Tyreek Stevenson is a number one, fully agree, with DJ Ivy as a number two. He's had a really good fall camp. Nickel corner to Corey Couch as a number one. He's been awesome. Daryl Porter, transfer from West Virginia. He's good as a number two. Safety. Avante Williams as a one with Cam Kinchins as a two. Other safety spot, James Williams as a one, number zero. He's incredible. With Al Blades Jr. as a number two. Blades, Blades is going to get some work, I think, at star as well. Al Blades is having a nice camp. And then outside corner, the other side of it, Daryl Porter, number one, with Isaiah Dunson, who's another guy I do not sleep on at the number two. Miami's got a very, very deep defensive backfield. I want to talk more about overlooked players. Some of these that I mentioned, because some of the players that came up on the on this depth chart, I think get a little bit overlooked by me, by certain members of our audience, and by a lot of media folks out there. We'll talk about that right after we talk about the importance of driving sober. Are you one of those people that thinks it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen, you say? You end up driving below the speed limit? It's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It is not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high. Get a DUI. 
Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen on this lovely Sunday, your first listen and your first watch. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Odyssey. We're available free on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and hit that thumbs up button. We're trying, guys. We want to get to the YouTube channel has been growing leaps and bounds, and I can't thank you guys enough for helping us with that because we can't do it without you. Um, we want to get to 5,000 subscribers by the Texas A&M game. That's our next goal. We, we went over 4K a little while ago. We'd love to get to 5,000 subs by Texas A&M on September 17th. So if you haven't hit subscribe, hit that button now. And if you haven't spread the word to your friends who love college football and love Canes football, spread the word, man. Let's help us grow. So players that we might be sleeping on, okay? Um, my motivation for this was when we did a recent episode a few days ago about the, the most explosive players on the Hurricanes roster, uh, you know, we, we probably mentioned six or seven different players, but um, we got comments on who we left out. And one player that was brought up multiple times by viewers and listeners was Frank Ladson. Why did we not bring up Frank Ladson in explosive players? Um, I hope he does have a history of explosions at Clemson. His most productive season came 2020 as a sophomore. He averaged 15.6 yards per catch that year with the Clemson Tigers, scored two touchdowns, and he had five catches of 20 or more yards, including a 54-yard catch that year. So those are explosive plays, being a threat downfield. And yes, when you have a quarterback like Tyler Van Dyke, who specializes in delivering bombs down the field, Frank Ladson, I hope and pray, can be very explosive this year. So that's a player we've been accused of overlooking. You know, he's uh, he's had kind of a quiet camp. But I think Charleston Rambo had kind of a quiet camp last year as well, and that didn't really seem to affect him at all during the regular season. He only went out there, did Rambo, and set single-season records as a Miami Hurricanes receiver. Uh, another player, I talked about him a little bit with the depth chart, a player that I have found myself guilty of sleeping on, maybe a few others, but I'll put the blame squarely on me, Al Blades Jr., have I been sleeping too much on Al Blades? You know, He has been haunted the last couple of years by injuries, illnesses, had sports hernia surgery, had dealt a couple seasons ago with myocarditis. Like, this guy is a warrior. Um, Al, he's never going to be completely overlooked, given his lineage. I mean, he's the son of the great Al Blades Sr. Uh, he's the nephew of Benny and Brian Blades. So he is, he is a legacy of all legacies. So he'll never be forgotten. But I do think Al Blades is being overlooked a little bit. And his versatility is going to allow him to get on the field a lot. He's been working primarily as a safety in camp, where he had previously been primarily a cornerback. So he's primarily a safety now. He can also play, of course, at corner, can play at nickel, or can play at the star position as well. He's intelligent enough as Al Blades to adapt to just about any position in the backfield. And I'm expecting him to be an important piece who we're going to see on the field a lot. Blades, of course, never fully forgotten and I think this year he's going to remind everybody myself included we should have been talking about him a lot more um, I'll bring this name back up for overlooked players again Corey Flagg I mean easy to overlook because of his size and whatever perceived limitations we have of Corey Flagg but you know Charlie Strong has said he has had the best camp out of all the linebackers that means something to me coming from Charlie Strong so I am not sleeping on Corey Flagg neither should you uh, Thad Franklin, you know, maybe you're not sleeping on him. Maybe I'm just kind of projecting this one, but, you know, he doesn't get talked about a whole lot because people talk a lot about Parrish and Rooster. When's Don Chaney going to come back? And I think I have been sometimes guilty of pigeonholing Thad just as a short yardage guy. He's also got soft hands catching passes out of the backfield. And I haven't forgotten last year. I mean, your, your short yardage guy averaged seven and a half yards per carry last year. Now, a lot of that damage was done against Central Connecticut. That probably boosted his average up a little bit. But like his best overall game, I think, was against Duke, uh, where he averaged 7.5 in that game. Uh, and just a really, really well-rounded game for him. Had a big catch last year. So... There's nothing wrong with his size. I mean, he's a 240-pound bulldozer, but I think he's surprisingly fleet of foot 
for his size and he's got good hands for his size. So I think we, we probably sleep on that a little bit. Gilbert Frierson is another one. Um, you know, he's probably going to be the number one guy at that star position. Uh, you know, I thought he had a really good spring game and, uh, I, I think he's going to put it all together this year. And then the last one I'll bring up to you players that we overlook a little bit too much. I, I did talk about this young man with the depth chart as well. Michael Redding, the third had a good camp. Um, he's very, very motivated. I had a chance to speak to him at the media day a little less than a month ago and I can just tell how hard Redding is working and how excited he is for this opportunity. New offense, uh, you know, another year of chemistry with Tyler Van Dyke. He's only had four catches in his past three years at Miami, but I think this could be a season where Redding can put it all together. So let's not sleep on these guys, okay? Um, so an interesting recruiting note here. Miami is recruiting cornerback Dijon Johnson hard. Okay, this was an exclusive from allhurricanes.com. Six foot one, 180 pound prospect who was originally uh, committed to Ohio State. It has not stopped programs across the country for going after Dijon Johnson. Miami, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, many others would still like to sign him. And after his game on Friday night, he had the following to say about Miami. Coach Mario Cristobal, Coach Jamila Adai, Coach Demarcus Van Dyke, really the whole staff, he said. I kid you not, really the whole staff. I like what they're doing. They really want me, and I can feel it. So the entire staff is recruiting the mustard man, Dijon Johnson. You know, something else, uh, we had uh, Miami Central beating IMG on Friday night. You had Francis Maui Goa looking really, really good on that IMG offensive line. And he spent the early part of the game blocking Miami target Reuben Bain, another Miami legacy. I hope we land Reuben Bain. And like Maui Goa was canceling him out. And then Bain moved away from Maui Goa and ended up with three sacks and had a huge game. So I thought, and obviously IMG, like half of their roster are Miami commits and Miami targets, but I thought Maui Goa and then Reuben Bain on the other side really stood out. And Reuben Bain's been a riser. Like he has been a guy who the longer this process goes, he's only getting higher touted through this process. And man, I hope Miami can get Bain over the finish line because he he is just he is a disruptor. Right. You put this guy in your D line, whether he's playing edge rusher playing end or playing tackle he is just a disruptor and he would be obviously he's already his family is a part of Miami history with Tolbert Bain but I, I would love to get Reuben Bain in here as well so that's going to do it for us want to thank you guys so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen and your first watch each and every day do us some solids my friends subscribe to our audio podcast feed we're available on apple Podcasts, spotify odyssey wherever you get your pods we are available video versions on youtube so make sure you subscribe there hit that thumbs up button and spread the word we give you new content every single day and yeah we're going to give you a ton of previews a ton of storylines from miami versus bethune cookman we are almost there six days away from some canes football Make sure you make Locked On ACC your second listen. Host Candace Cooper and the local experts take you around the conference in 30 minutes or less. Make Locked On ACC your second listen. Thank you for making us your first. We will talk to you guys again tomorrow on another episode of Locked On Canes. We are part of the awesome Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.